hey guys, welcome to another episode of Around the Table with Josh and Keenan. We are here with you and we are talking about week six. We're already on week six. Wow. Of more than a feeling. Time oh. flies when you're having fun. <laughs> That's right. And so we weren't with you last week. We had some things come up that we weren't able to record, yeah. um, scheduling conflicts. And so sorry we missed last week, but. This week, we're taking a look at 1 John 3, That's right. and it's a bit of a heavy passage um, that you don't really expect, and then you read it, and you're like, wow, I'm starting to question things. And so <laughs> we're going to dig into that a bit. We're going to look specifically at 1 John 3, 4 through 10, and the basic notion of this is that when we're with God, we essentially stop sinning, mm-hmm. and... We live in light of that new life and the new creation that we are. But if we keep on sinning, we're essentially children of the devil, which John tells us. Um, And so that can cause us to stop and think because, you know, once we're with Jesus, Mm. we still continue to sin. So what does that mean and what does that look like for us? And so do you have any introductory thoughts to that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's really a double down here with with John. I think, you know, in verse 4 uh, in the NLT, everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. And I think one of the things that we have a hard time, especially in our culture today and in even in our church families, um, we have a hard time calling out sin. Mm-hmm. We have a hard time identifying sin, and not necessarily in our own hearts, but be able to help people see the sin in their lives that is breaking God's laws. And, you know, the law of the Old Testament, I, I think I think what, what John's really referencing is, is the morality and the spiritual framework that God desires for us. And mm-hmm. that's what we're breaking, yeah. the relationship we're in. And, and, you know, when it comes to sin in my life, I, I desire... Um, obviously to be sinless, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's my utmost desire and relationship with Jesus is that I'm not doing anything against him. But at the same time, I have to recognize the things in my life that are contrary to him and deal with them, mm-hmm. right? And I think yeah. so often, especially in, in the church, we can almost put them under the rug and clo- put the rug down on it and say, I'm just not going to deal with it. Or we justify sin, whether it's endless worry or gossip or slander or the things that this culture almost promotes, mm-hmm. um, shouting other people down, not not wanting to be around people and just kind of talking about them behind their back, right? Those things are almost normal in our society. Yeah, We don't want to deal with them. So we run into a passage like this. It's almost like a spotlight's being put on on the things that we've tried to kept, keep hidden or try to justify. Yep. And now we got to reconcile that. For sure. And I think it's healthy that we wrestle with this because Mm -hmm. truth is hard, like Mm -hmm. you said. Like the true truth that comes from the gospel of Jesus is hard to wrestle with. And it's convicting and it's offensive to culture. It is. Like you just said. And so, but I think the cool thing is, you know, this is, we've been taking this in sections. We're going to be taking this book into 10 sections, but it would have been read, read straight through to the original hearers. And it's pretty cool in... 1 John 1, right at the beginning, our first or second week, John says in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so this isn't a new idea, even to John or even to us. Mm -hmm. He's just stating it more bluntly here, yeah, yeah. but we've been essentially talking about this um, during the duration of this series, and it's, it keeps coming up, and it's important because yeah. repetition is like a teaching tool, especially mm-hmm. back then when not a lot of people could read. And so this theme of darkness and light, living in sin, living without sin, is an important distinction that we need to be able to recognize with the Holy Spirit's help, yeah. which is huge. Yeah. Well, and the, the beauty, I think, of John's um, encouragement and uh, admonishment, admonition to the mm-hmm. church is he's got, he's got the first part where we're talking about sin, talking about the darkness, but then even in, 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 first, in the first chapter of 1 John as well as here in the third chapter, verse 5, and you know that Jesus came to take away our sins mm-hmm. and there's no sin in him. So he contrasts it. He says, hey, you're walking in the darkness or whoever's sinning is walking in the darkness. 
don't forget that it is only Jesus. And he came to take away. He came not to show you just the next step in life, but he came to show you the the trajectory of your life Mm -hmm. that the end game is leaving a life of sin entirely and not leading a life of sin, but leaving a life of sin. And that means we have to be on this active pursuit in our hearts to say, what sin is entangling me? And Mm -hmm. almost as Christians, the wrong question to ask is what am I doing right? Yeah. Right? Often we always say, well, I'm doing, I justify my actions because I did this right. Whether Mm -hmm. it's once a week I went to church yep. or I was I gave food away or I handed out a gift card to some. Sounds we always, like a Pharisee. We always try to highlight what I did right. Yeah. Jesus is almost saying, hey, t- take a look at the things that are still kind of rotten in your life. Yep. And if that's offensive to people, I have rotten things in my life. I have moments where, like Scott said on Sunday, you don't want to know what goes under my head. I have to reconcile that, right? Mm-hmm. It's not the action that comes out, but the thoughts in my head could be very sinful and yeah. I need to work through those because it's it's a sign of me not fully abiding in Jesus, not mm-hmm. fully remaining in him. Yeah. And I think you highlight a good point because we see that all throughout the gospels yeah. with people that Jesus encountered. The ones that he ministered to and that he came for yeah. were the ones who acknowledged their rottenness. Yeah who had hit wit's end and were reaching out for something more. Mm -hmm. And the people that Jesus railed against the most and had the most issues with with were the Pharisees who did everything you said. They were flouting their authority. They were saying, look how much I pray. Look how much I fast. Look how much I give. It's like, that doesn't matter to Jesus. It matters, but in a secondary term. Because when you're genuinely abiding in Jesus, that flows out of a heart that's turned towards him. And so in light of this passage, I think it's an important distinction to make that when John talks about living in sin and being without sin and all that mm-hmm. stuff, another part of the heart of this message is that we can't be intentional or justify or intentionally live in this sin. Mm-hmm. I know I said That's intentionally right. no, no, twice, no. but repetition, right? Yeah. And so when we're knowledgeably engaging in sin... yeah. As part of our old lifestyle, we're continuing that with Jesus. There's no evidence Mm -hmm. of heart transformation. Mm -hmm. It's in the heart transformation. So while we accept Jesus and our lives have been transformed by nature, we still fall into sin. We do. And so I believe that's what John is speaking to here as he has in previous sections. But I don't know. What do you think? Well, it's uh, so even going into verse six, um, anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understands who he is. And I, I think that's an active lifestyle mm-hmm. of keeps on sinning. And I hear so often people say, well, it's a habit and it's really hard to break. Or, you know, we talked about that even on Sunday yeah. morning. We have to recognize, I have to recognize for me, Josh, you have to recognize for you, anyone listening, we have a sin problem. Mm-hmm. It is a problem that is going to, that is is almost like it's, well, it is. It's terminal, right? Yep, it's, it is. It, it's because of our sin nature that we have to reconcile with that in an everlasting way by just clinging to Jesus, but in a daily way to mm-hmm. cling to him daily. And that's what that anyone who remains in him will not sin. And it's just that idea of if I'm abiding with Jesus, my eyes are now fixed on things above. Yep. I've got a kingdom mindset. Mm-hmm. I'm not focused on these other things. And I begin to sin less. As long as my eyes are fixed forward and for the kingdom and abiding in him, the things that I'll look back in a year, and I I have, and it's not to be righteous, but you realize, oh, I haven't picked that up in a long time. I don't Mm -hmm. need to pick that up. I don't need to be maybe in that relationship. I don't need to maybe consume that. It could be a drug. It could be excessive amounts of alcohol. It could be a lot of things. I don't need to look at that. I don't need to participate in that, right? So you all of a sudden start realizing oh, I'm so glad I've left that. And it's not because I really tried hard. It's because I just fixed my eyes on Jesus in exactly. his way and spent time with him. He pulls our eyes away from that. Mm-hmm. So, Yep, a heart centered on Jesus changes a lot of things. That's right. And oh, so, man. Yeah, and we've been talking a lot about that, just you and me and staff mm-hmm. in general. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, you had mentioned this morning about hitting your face yeah. first thing in the morning yeah. to get centered. And it's like, Man, what a difference that makes. We we often, and I'll talk about personally, we can feel hollow, um, mm-hmm. especially when we come to really know the Lord and we feel maybe distant from Him or from, the, you know, you don't feel the Spirit or the presence of God in your life. 
you feel hollow, you feel empty. Um, when we're hollow and empty without Jesus, there's room now for other things to creep in. Mm, could yep. be could be greed. It could be um, uh, manipulation. It could it's be all these subtle things. Too. Very subtle, and it slowly flows into our hearts and takes a place that Jesus is supposed to. Um, recently, I've found myself over the past weeks waking up in almost this depressive mindset, and it's not to alarm anybody. Please don't be alarmed. Yeah. Because I force myself, and sometimes it takes some time, to get on my face. And when I say that, I don't mean it. I have to be on my hands and knees with my face on the carpet Mm -hmm. and just talking to God. And there's no eloquent prayer. There's no phone app next to me. With I'm just asking God to fill me for the day. Give me my daily bread. And I rise up 10 times out of 10 a different person. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I've tried hard enough. I think it's because I've humbled myself, even in my posture, to say, Mm -hmm. Jesus, I need you. Like, I need you. Yep. And from there, my eyes aren't fixed on anything that would lead me to sin. They're mm-hmm. just fixed on him. Yeah. It's that emptying of yeah. yourself that I think is so prevalent. And yeah. that's something I've been learning, too, is the more I empty myself. There's a great song called More of Jesus, which says, if more of you means less of me, take everything. Yeah. And we did it wow. at our last young adult night. And literally ever since then, that's been my prayer every morning. That's if so more of you means less of me, take everything. Yeah. And what a difference that has made because... And what a dangerous prayer. <laughs> very dangerous. It's it's dangerous at first, yeah. initially, the first few times, but then you realize you have that day where you mm-hmm. forget to t- pray, and it's like the worst day ever. Yeah. And then you're like trying to figure out, oh, why did this... Why was this such a bad day? It's like, oh, well, I didn't start my day with Jesus. That's why. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And so once you get that experience, it becomes tough to mm-hmm. not have mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And so, well, one of the things um, we we have a resource here that's going to be helpful. But I wanted to share um, just for all of you you out there that are listening, as we talk about sin, as we talk about um, just the things that are contrary to God's um, will, there is a, a feeling in us that comes up, and it can be classified either as guilt or shame. Mm-hmm. Um, we feel guilty very often, but it can lead to shame. And I want to encourage you: do not feel ashamed, yes. because it is something that we all wrestle with. It is something that we all have to walk through. Mm -hmm. The guilt is the healthy part because that's God waking us up, ringing the dinner bell on us and saying, hey, you got to come back to me. And when we feel that, you've got to run back to him. And it takes a community. Mm -hmm. It takes intentionality. So you have a church family to come and be supported by. We've got to be vulnerable and willing to share what's going on in our lives, but know that our church family, the people in them, the life groups, the hospitality team, the prayer team, they're for you. Yep. And so come to them. Talk about these things. We'll pray for you and know that there's freedom on the other side of that. And the shame is what's going to try to lock you into the mess that you're in and mm-hmm. kind of cage you in. Yeah, Don't yield to that shame. Yep. And I just wanted to share that because I know That's that so good. it can get heavy um, sometimes. And this is this goes into all sorts of sin. And we all see that through the scriptures. This defines what sin is for mm-hmm. us. Um so just know that there is a, we all wrestle with it, but there's a place oh, yeah. here in the church to support you. Yeah, no one's immune from it. So yeah. if you're sitting here this evening and you're wrestling with that, yeah. you know, yeah. you're not alone yeah, in right. that because that's something we've all experienced before, mm-hmm. like Keenan said. So totally. don't hesitate to reach out. So how is this resource going to help us here, Josh? Yeah, so we've been talking a lot about prayer recently. We have yeah. prayer nights every Tuesday from 6 to 7.30 yeah. here in the auditorium. Such a sweet time. You've Last week, come. we had 42 people come. There's a baptism. baptism. There might be a baptism this week. There will be. There um, will be. Yeah. I'm getting yeah. confirmation that there will yeah. be a baptism. So show up. There's worship. It's just such a sweet time mm-hmm. together. But... In lieu of, in light of that, um, this book, Prayer, by Tim Keller, the greatest book on prayer that I've ever read outside of the Bible. I highly encourage this. This changed my prayer life radically. Yeah. And one of the main things it talks about is the Lord's Prayer as a template yeah. for prayer. Not merely reciting the Lord's Prayer mm-hmm. verbatim, but taking each section mm. and praying it back to God and whatever mm. comes to your heart. And so I literally can't recommend this book enough. It's just good. so good. I read it four or five years ago. I need to read it again. Um, but yeah, Prayer by Tim Keller. Yeah, pick that up, read through it. I just love that idea of Jesus giving us 
not a verbatim word for it, but just this template to have yeah. communion with him and the Father. It's the only thing. If you look through the scripture, it is the only thing in the four gospels that is recorded the disciples asking Jesus to teach them. Yeah. It's the only thing. In Luke 11, they ask, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Every other verse in the Gospels, they're not asking him to teach anything. <laughs> Jesus is just giving it to them. Yeah. But it's what, I mean, that shows the importance of prayer. That's right. You that's know, right. Is that, you know, that's the one thing they ask to be taught yeah. from the Savior of the world. I don't know about you, but I'd ask him a lot more. I would. I would totally but, ask him. But I think just to, I don't want to drag this out, but they saw him going and praying. Mm-hmm. And I think they almost craved what he was receiving. Yeah. And they said, Jesus, we got to know, mm-hmm. what does it look like to pray like you pray? Yeah. And uh, he teaches them a totally different radical it's wild. prayer rhythm. So, well, great, Josh. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Prayer by Tim Keller. Um, again, you've got a resource here in the church family. We want to support you, come around you, because when we abide in Jesus, our eyes are fixed on him, and we're leaving a life of active sin. Mm-hmm. And so we we ask and, and pray for that for everybody in our church family. Yep. So so good. I can uh, close this in prayer. Great. And then uh, we'll let you all get on with your evening or however you're listening to this. We hope you have a great rest of your evening or day. So, mm-hmm. Father, we just come before you and just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the price that he paid for us, the price that you paid through him for us, um, so that we can be in an abiding and thriving relationship with you. And Father, may you help us leave the active um, sin or lifestyle in our lives that is just against you and contrary to you because you have so much more for us. Mm -hmm. So Father, help us find that freedom. Help those that are listening in that that desperately need community for this. Father, make a way for them. Give them the courage to reach out. And Father, just ultimately draw us into communion with you so that we can be transformed for your kingdom's sake. We love you. We worship you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you guys next week.